We are in the Gospel of John. We're continuing our study. We're actually coming down to the last couple weeks of John. And the next two weeks, we're going to be looking specifically at, uh, about Jesus on the cross. And so, um, you know, in our modern culture of media and film and video games, we have become experts of becoming shocked at nothing. We boast that we've seen everything, and to a certain extent, we have with the existence of technology. In a simple update on our phones, we can hear about a massacre in a mosque in the other side of the world, and we can grieve. We can see bloody images of bodies after a bomb that set off at a church in Egypt and see brothers and sisters who have died for their faith. We can see bodies stacked on top of each other after violence against Christians in Nigeria. We can see torture of people left and right. And using the exact same technology, we can click a button and see breathtaking photographs from the Hubble telescope of ginormous planets, shimmering galaxies, brilliant stars. We can watch tear-jerking videos of strangers caring for each other, of babies being silly and pets being stupid. We have become experts in viewing such things as film, seeing an image of deep space, hearing some breaking news across the globe, and thinking about it for two seconds, and then moving on to something else. Nothing seems to capture our affections or hold our attention much anymore. I remember when 9-11 happened that I was glued in front of the television for almost weeks trying to find out what was going to happen next. And if I'm being brutally honest with you, when the shootings happened at the mosque across the other side of the world, I read an article, maybe two articles, grieved, read the summary about it, and then continued on with life. Almost have become immune to the shock that such incidents ought to create in one's life. And I say all of that because we have to be careful that when we come to the cross of Jesus, that it's not just another story that we're reading, that we don't view it and two seconds later push it aside as if it was a, just some random event. This story, this event in history has to capture our attention. It has to captivate us not just this morning, but it has to captivate us every single day. Because every day we lay it aside and every day we treat it as just a humdrum event, as an ordinary event not worth our meditation or our time. We wander away from what it is that makes our faith so different from every other faith, every other religion in the world. I remember sitting in a room with pastors and imams and rabbis and atheists, and they were having this conversation that we need to push aside everything that makes us different and focus on those things that we can agree on and so we could have better harmony and peace in the world. And to an extent, I agree with that. But listen, friends, the one thing that makes the faith, the Christianity different from every other religion is we believe that God died for us. That God took on flesh, lived a life that we could not live, and died the death that we should have died so that we could be sons and daughters of God. And when we take this story and treat it lightly, we wander from what propels us to be salt and light in the world that God has called us to live in. So this morning and next Sunday, God willing, we're going to take a long, hard, slow look at the cross. And it will be a solemn time. It may get real quiet in here at times because this isn't a flippant event and it's not a pretty event. We're about to step onto holy ground and we need to take a deep breath and hear what the Holy Spirit has to teach us today from this all-important passage in John 19. So we're going to take two weeks to look at this passage 
And we're going to observe six things from this passage about the death of Jesus on the cross. We're going to learn that he suffered so that we could be free. That he was mocked so that we might be loved. He was exposed so that we might be clothed. That he was rejected, that we might be welcomed. That he was thirsty, that we might be satisfied. That he endured, that we might be forgiven. So let's read this passage together, and let's look at the first of these two things this morning. John 19, verses 16 to 30. And so then, because of them, he handed Jesus over to be crucified, and therefore they took Jesus away. And carrying his own cross, he went out to what is called the skull's place, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign that was lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew and in Latin and in Greek. And so the chief priest said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes. They divided them into four parts. They part for each soldier. They took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. And they said to one another, let's not tear it, but toss for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfill the scriptures that says, they divided my clothes among themselves. They cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus was his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there. And so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on hyssop and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. So two things I want to look at this morning and four things next week. The first thing I want us to see this morning is Jesus suffered that we might be free. Jesus suffered that we might be free. Look at verse 16. So then, because of them, he handed them over to be crucified, and therefore they took Jesus away. Remember the story we've been going through this week by week. The trial is now over. Pilate has determined by divine decree that Jesus is now going to be crucified. And just as Jesus was born in the fullness of time, so he, Jesus also will be crucified in the fullness of time. History will now hinge on the cross of Jesus. Our calendars turn on this event before Jesus, after Jesus. Creation and even angels, no doubt, take a deep breath. And for a few hours, pause to see this momentous occasion an occasion that was not cheered for, but one that was mourned for. You see, God had to die for the sins of humanity. If he didn't, then all of creation would continue to mourn and continue to um, groan and bear under the weight of the curse of sin. Not only that, but all of mankind, including you and I, would find our journey leading to one inevitable destination, hell. An eternity of misery apart from the presence of God. As I was thinking about this story, I could picture creation from the furthest reaching island to the top of the highest snow-capped mountain going silent for just a few hours. The winds cease to blow. A hush is heard through all creation as animals cease to hunt, birds cease to fly, fish just hover in one location in the sea. Something heavy was in the air. If you were in a foreign country that morning, you would have no doubt sent something strange was going on. 
And as the camera pans from creation, from the galaxies and zooms into the city of Jerusalem with its four walls, we go from silence in creation to what seems to a mass chaos as it sounds like gladiator games with a packed coliseum of bloodthirsty fans. The noise level in Jerusalem around Pilate's, col- Pilate's courtroom was deafening. And amidst the uproar, you can hear the chants, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And you would wonder how evil, how monstrous, how hideous this person must be that is being crucified. He must be on par with Jeffrey Dahmer or Hitler or Stalin. No doubt this morning in Jerusalem, justice is being served as this wicked person is being put to death. And as the camera zooms in even closer, we see that it's a man, well, at least in a resemblance of a man. You see, it's hard to tell if it's even a human. We can recognize some facial features like an eye socket, but we can't even see his eyes because they've been virtually shut, swollen shut because he's been looked like he just came out of a boxing match. We see resemblance of a nose, but it's not at the center of his face, but it's broken and swollen. You can't get a really good look at his face because it's immersed in blood from top to bottom. You would think that someone that's endured this would be passed out, unable to stand, for the blood had drenched his robe that was purple, is now crimson red. And there's a makeshift crown on his head, but as you zoom in, you realize it's not the crown that's fitting for a king, but it's one made of thorns, which are about 6 to 12 inches long. And you can only see a few inches because the rest has been embedded into his skull. That would explain the twitching you see as his nerves have been punctured and no doubt his brain has been tapped by these thorns. He is truly a miserable sight, basically a hunk of meat that is amazingly able to stand on his own two feet. It is such a wretched sight that as you look up to the crowd, you see those who are chanting for his crucifixion have resorted to chanting with their heads held down where others are looking up into the sky or others have completely turned away because they can't stomach the sight and yet they're still screaming for him to suffer even more. And you pan in and you hear a little bit of the story from someone in the crowd and you realize that this man is not who you thought he was. He hasn't murdered anyone. He hasn't robbed anyone. He hasn't even attempted to overthrow the government. Instead, you find out that he healed people. You found out that he fed people. You find out that he loved people that others did not love. That he had turned people's lives around for good. He had brought them from despair to hope, from sorrow to joy, from brokenness to wholeness. And then you hear that his crime is that he claimed to be God, which leads you to think that maybe he's just delusional. He's just a delusional man, not quite playing with a full deck. And then you hear about the words that he spoke and how people would fall silent when he raised his voice, and you realize he couldn't have been crazy. Maybe he was a deceiver then, someone who was under the influence of demons. But then you hear that he used to cast out demons, and how he selflessly served and cared for people, and how he chose to hang out with the lowly and the marginalized of the culture. You realize he couldn't be a deceiver, because what advantage would a deceiver have doing these kind of things. He wasn't running for a political office. He was from a little town called Nazareth, and he was the son of a poor family. There must be more than meets the eye to this man, and you would be right because this man was the Son of God, Jesus Christ. God incarnate. God the creator in human flesh. And this Jesus who never committed a single crime, who did nothing but love people, who did nothing but point them to everlasting joy with his Father and rescue them from the inevitable destination of hell, 
this Jesus, friends, suffered immensely. And it was not something he did. It was not something for what he did. It was because of what you and I did. The Bible makes it clear that we are in bondage to sin. We are held captive by its iron grip, and it's slowly but surely dragging us to the depths of hell. And sadly, there is nothing we can do to rescue ourselves. And truth be told, we don't want to be rescued. We like to think of ourselves as free, free to choose our own life, free to choose our own destiny, free to choose our own future. And after all, we are the masters of our own fate, the captain of our own soul. But what we call freedom, friends, is really bondage. We are imprisoned by our own desires, caught by our own need for approval and acceptance, enslaved by our unquenchable passion for satisfaction. We're like a fish that jumps to the shore thinking that it's free from the tyranny of water. We're like a train that's jumped off the tracks, tumbling down the mountainside, real, um, real, and thinking that it has freedom from the tracks. Friends, we kid ourselves if we think we're really free apart from Jesus. But our lack of vision and our acknowledgement of our need did not stop Jesus from going on a rescue mission to set us truly free. Romans 5 says it this way, God showed his love for us that while we were still sinners, he died for us. John 8, Jesus' words, he says, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And John, in our text, ironically uses, says that Pilate delivered Jesus to be crucified. The word there is the same word that was Jesus, used for Judas when he betrayed Jesus. Pilate betrayed Jesus. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. His wife had warned him that she had a dream that this man was innocent, not to kill him. But Pilate cared more about his name and his reputation than he did for justice, than he did for Jesus. He was caught. He wasn't free. The crowd wasn't free that morning. The soldiers weren't free that morning. The religious leaders weren't free that morning. Pilate wasn't free. The, truly, the only man that was free was the man that was in chains, and that was Jesus. Pilate Pilate, like so many, was a corrupt politician whose initial good intentions were swallowed up by his passion that everyone has to make for a name for themselves. And in the end, his passion for people to like him, to be remembered, to have a name, erode, overrode his passion for justice and righteousness. And therefore, he betrayed Jesus over to this angry mob who were like sharks in a frenzy at the smell of the blood of Jesus. All of the tactics of Pilate to release Jesus have failed, and now begins the crucifixion. And so I want to summarize all the Gospels together to bring, you, bring the story to you. First, the Roman soldiers, who had put on this marvelous display of mockery and antics, surrounded Jesus like a turkey, vultures, and grabbed him with both arms, one on each side, and they dragged him over a slab of wood and literally had his name on it. No doubt it had been crafted by a carpenter just a few days ago. Ironically, Jesus himself was the son of a carpenter. He was a carpenter by trade. Joseph, his stepfather, had taught him this trade growing up. But as Jesus looked at the slab of wood lying on the ground with his eyes glazed over and the audio of the crowd chanting, crucify him, crucify him, he realized that this one was for him. This is a cross that he and the Father had talked about him bearing before the world had begun. This was the cross from the foundation of the world. It was the culmination of his mission that he had been sent on to rescue lost sinners and restore earth back to its original luster and place the glory of the Father back at the center of the universe by bringing justice and righteousness to bear. The rescue mission was about complete. And this was by far going to be the most difficult part. He had to suffer for our sins in order that we might be free. He had to suffer for us so that we might be free. 
Now, friends, listen, Jesus had all the power and the authority in the world to shake the two soldiers that were holding him and to get rid him, and to rid himself of this horrible scene. He could have ended it with a word, just like he healed a little girl or calmed a storm or fed the 5,000 people on, this, on the hillside. One word would have ended all the suffering that Jesus endured. He could have called for help, and in an instant, 10,000 angels would have been by his side. He had every right to abandon the mission, for the crowd didn't want rescuing, and it didn't want freedom, and friends, neither did we. You know, it's easy for us to picture ourselves in this scene, and we can look at disgust at the crowd for yelling, crucify him, crucify him, but don't do that, because... It's you and I that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. None of us were standing by Jesus whispering encouraging words, but rather we were all chanting along with the crowd, we want to get rid of him, we want nothing to do with him, get him out of our lives. And yet Jesus does not abandon the mission, he perseveres, he endures the mockery and the pain. It wasn't the nails that held him there, but it was his love. For you and I. And so the text says he picked up the cross. Verse 17, carrying his own cross, he went out what is called to the skull place, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. The language says that he himself bore his own cross and went out. The idea is that he didn't need any help from anyone. He willingly went over to that cross and he picked it up and placed it on his already skin-torn shoulders. These were shoulders that were lacerated and looked as if someone had taken a box cutter to his back a hundred times. And now what Jesus picked up was basically a horizontal beam of the cross. Contrary to what you see in images, he didn't carry the entire cross, just the beam. The part itself would have weighed over a hundred pounds. And so the procession began as the soldiers would have tied his arms to that beam to make sure he didn't drop it. Two thieves were with Jesus on this journey. All three were behind soldiers carrying the signs with details for the reasons for their crucifixion. And in front of them was a centurion leading a march from Pilate's courtroom to Golgotha, which was about six football fields in distance. The centurion would lead the procession through as many streets as possible simply so they could add to the shame of those being crucified and to be sure to the entire community that they would see what would happen if you stood against Rome. The other Gospels tells us that Jesus fell under the weight of carrying the cross. Remember the previous day, he had been sweating drops of blood and he hasn't slept in a good 36 hours. He had been arrested, beaten repeatedly, beaten some more, flogged by Roman soldiers till he was virtually dead and then beaten again. He had lost enormous amounts of blood and the fact that these thorns were piercing his brain probably blurred his vision. The fall would have, would have been a face plant because his arms were unable to catch him from hurting himself, forcing his face to slam into the hard ground, causing some thorns in his head to break off while others went deeper into his skull. The scream that proceeded from his mouth no doubt echoed the passageways as they headed to Golgotha. Crowds would have been following, mocking Jesus, ridiculing him because of his inability to carry his own cross beam. And when Jesus fell to the ground, the centurion, anxious to hurry up and get the crucifixion over with, quickly glanced over to the crowd and selected a man to carry the cross for Jesus, Simon of Serene from North Africa. And now Jesus staggers as he leads Simon on the way to Golgotha, blood no doubt leaving a marked path that flowed from his body. Verse 18, and there they crucified him two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Jesus was crucified between two others who Luke says, one of whom repented. The prophecies of the Old Testament are now becoming fulfilled, left and right. Isaiah 53 says, therefore I will divide him a portion with the many and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, and yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Ironically, these two thieves that were next to Jesus are called robbers in Matthew, which was the same word that was used for Barabbas. 
That means they were either accomplices with Barabbas or that this cross that Jesus was carrying was actually meant for Barabbas. And now when Jesus would have arrived, they would have ripped the robe off that they had been wearing that they placed on him and mocking him. No doubt his back has become so adherent to the clots of blood and the wounds that have formed. Its removal would have been like carelessly ripping a band-aid off of a flesh wound and the adhesive just stuck on. This would have been excruciating pain, almost as if he was getting beaten again and the wounds would open up again. John tells us simply that they crucified him. He doesn't add any more details. Because why? Because the crucifixion was a reality for the readers of John during that day. According to Josephus, before, after Herod the Great died, the Roman governor at that time crucified 2,000 men in order to stop an uprising. He also said that when Titus attacked Jerusalem in AD 70, that he crucified so many people that they ran out of crosses. It is estimated that by the time Jesus was crucified, some 30,000 people have already gone through its shadows before him. And while John saw no need to explain it because it was an everyday occurrence in the life of believers during that day, we need to look at it more deeply. Now when Simon, who had been carrying the beam of the cross for Jesus, arrived at Golgotha, they had no doubt been ordered to place the beam on the ground and Jesus is quickly thrown on top of it. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of his wrist and drives a heavy square iron nail, similar to a railroad spike, but much sharper. He drives it through the wrist of Jesus, not his hands, and deep into the wood. Jesus would have let out a blood-curdling scream as the hammer struck the nail many, many times. And the legionnaire would quickly move to the other side and repeat these exact same steps being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow for such movement. And they, the four soldiers performing this work, would place Jesus on the vertical beam as he lays down on the beam that's nailed to his wrist as it stretched across his upper back. And once the beam is mounted vertically, they would then take the left foot and press it backward against the right foot. And with both feet extended, toes down, a nail was driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately fixed, flexed, driving it all the way through the Achilles tendons into the wood. And then they would lift him up and they would drop the now formed cross into a pre-dug hole. And as the cross dropped, the full weight of his body would be supported by the nails, which would begin to stretch the holes that had been made in his wrists and the arch of his foot. The jolt of the drop and the weight of his body upon those nails would actually cause those bones to go out of joint. Another prophecy. Psalm 22. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. And as Jesus slowly slags down and more with more weight on the nails in the wrists, excruciating, fiery pains begin to shoot through his fingers and up the arms and explodes in the brain. Jesus has never experienced pain like this in his life. And he pushes himself upward to avoid the stretching torture of his arms. He places the full weight of the nails in the arch of his feet. The tensing of the muscles as he shifts from his hands to his feet would cause them to get cramped up. And now because of the cramps, he's unable to push himself upward. Hanging by his arms, the muscles grow paralyzed and the air can now only be drawn into the lungs but not exhaled. He struggles against the cramping and the fatigue to just lift himself enough to get one short breath. Keep in mind that when he lifts himself up his back, still raw from the beating, it's sliding down an old rugged piece of wood, splinters digging into his back as well. The flesh was being scraped against the wood as he went up simply to catch a breath. Death is now settling in. Carbon dioxide is building up in the bloodstream. The pain in his chest increases tremendously as the beam slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. The compressed heart is now struggling to pump 
heavy, thick, oil-like blood into tissues while the tortured lungs are making a frantic effort to gasp one small gulp of air. Friends, this was all for our freedom. He suffered that we might be free. He suffered that we might be forgiven. Your sin, my sin, caused Jesus his very life. And yet willingly and gladly, he lays his life up for you and I. Our sin forces Jesus to raise himself up against the cross, leaving parts of his already open back against that old piece of wood. But his love for the Father and his love for you and I moves him to do this despite the pain. Your sin forces carbon dioxide to mount into his lung and causes Jesus to grasp for air, but his love for the Father and his love for you and I pushes him to breathe in the life-giving air. Your sin forces his muscles to cramp and for his heart to pump at a deadly pace, but his love for the Father and his love for you and I drives him to endure and press on. It was for our sake that he suffered. And can I just say that Jesus is calling us this morning to lay aside our suicidal love affair with this world, to lay down our life, to find freedom in him. He has come to set us free, to be truly free. Why do we stay in bondage to what is killing us? Why do we stay addicted to sins that destroy us? Step into freedom, stern to Jesus. He didn't die simply so that we could play church. He didn't die simply so we could check off that we read scripture. He didn't die simply so that we could just go through the motions and go on with life. He died to set us free, to make much of him and tell of his love to the world. What are we doing with the freedom that God has given us? He suffered that we might be free. Number two, he was mocked that we might be loved. He was mocked that we might be loved. Verse 19, Pilate also has a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus, the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read that sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And so the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write king of the Jews, but say, write that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. John tells us that before Jesus was lifted up, they nailed a sign with his death sentence above his head. It mockingly read king of the Jews, which is ironic because that's exactly who he was. John also tells us the location of the crucifixion was along a main highway. It was the place where many citizens would pass on their daily routines. The goal of the sign, the goal of the location was to make sure that as many people possible will get a chance to hurl mockery and ridicule at the one being crucified. And the sign had the dominant languages of the day so everyone could read what they had done. Latin was used by the citizens within Rome. Greek was the most used by commoners outside of Rome. And Hebrew was by the Jewish religious people. Pilate had all of his bases covered and wanted to make sure that every man, woman, and child would participate in the mockery of Jesus. This is exactly what was prophesied. Psalm 22 says it this way, I'm a worm, not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Verse 16 of Psalm 22 says, For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircle me, encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count my bones. They stare, they gloat over me. 
Think about the fact that in the beginning of John's gospel, it is confirmed that this is the same Jesus that was the creator of the universe. John 1 says that all things were made through him, and without him there is not a single thing that was made. Now imagine what Jesus knew and what Jesus was able to do. He had, in his sovereign power, created the tree that was made into this cross where he hung. He had made the rocks that had been chiseled down to make the nails that were driven into his wrist and his feet. He made the hill on which he stood suspended. He made the setting sun and the birds that flew by. He even created the fabric from which the clothes were made, which these mockers used. He even created the people themselves and gave them vocal cords that are now being used to mock and jeer him. The entire scene was created by our Savior. And he had every right in the world to just step down and with one word set off a cataclysmic event that would have turned every one of them into a piece of dirt. He didn't deserve the scorn, the mockery, the ridicule, but you and I did. You see, he didn't just live the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died, including the mockery and the jeering. We deserve to be mocked for eternity by God and the angels. We are the ones willing to give up eternal pleasures and happiness for little temporal grains of sands of pleasure here. We're the ones willing to shun the love of Jesus and hurl ourselves headlong into the empty pleasures of this world. If anyone should be mocked, it should be us. Angels should have been laughing at us. They should have scorned us and shook their heads at disgust as we are willing to trample under the feet of the blood of Jesus. We should be the one experiencing hell that Jesus bore, an eternal non-life of regret that Solomon warns us about in Proverbs. Proverbs says it this way, at the end of your life, you will groan. When your flesh and your body are consumed, you will say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I didn't listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregations. Listen, this is what we deserved, friends. But he bore it instead. He was mocked so that we could be loved. He took your mockery and gave you all the praise and adoration. We sang it this morning. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. And because he's so good, what are we? We are blessed. We are saved. We are anointed. We are healed. We are forgiven. None of that are things that we deserve. We don't deserve to be called blessed. We don't deserve to be called anointed. We don't deserve to be called highly favored. Everything you deserved and I deserved, he got. And everything he deserved, we got. Praise God. His life for our life. His righteousness for our righteousness. His heaven for our hell. This is why now the Father can love us because we have put our faith and our life in the hands of Jesus. We gave him our messed up life and he gave us his perfect life. And now the Father, when he looks at us, he sees beauty instead of brokenness. He sees holiness instead of wretchedness. He sees perfection Instead of sin, praise God, praise God, praise God. You know deep in your conscience that you are going to have to answer for this life and how you have wasted it and messed it up. Before I came to Jesus while I was a junior in high school, my life came rushing to me like a flood. It was up to my eyeballs in guilt and shame. I knew I had taken the road most traveled and I messed up everything that was given to me. But when I came to Jesus, I realized that I'll never have to answer for my life. 
I won't get mocked for my sin because Jesus was already mocked for me. He bore my shame. All I will hear one day is, well done, good and faithful servant. No ridicule, no mockery, no jesting. Only Jesus will say, I paid for his sin. And the father will say, welcome, son, I love you. My friends, that's not just fair, it is glorious. It's glorious. Heaven and hell are as real as the chair that you are sitting on this morning. If they didn't exist and there was no point for Jesus to die on the cross at all, he didn't suffer simply to inspire you. He didn't get mocked to be a good example for you. He did all of this because hell is real and it is forever. And his work, friends, demands your life. Tim Keller says, in, every, in our effort to make God more loving, we have made God less loving in saying that there's no hell. His love, in the end, needed to make no action. It was sentimentality, not love at all. The worship of a God like this will be impersonal, ethical. There'll be no joyful self-abandonment, no humble boldness, no constant sense of wonder. We would not sing to such beings love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. He suffered that we might be free. He was mocked. so that we could be loved. As we go to communion this morning, would you for a moment reflect on that love that's so amazing, on that love that's so divine? And would you realize that it demands your soul, your life, your all? It demands it. Jesus didn't die simply so that you could be a Sunday Christian. It demands your life, your soul, your all. Would you walk with Jesus for a few moments into the freedom that he has given you and the love that he has showered you through faith and repentance? Would you reflect on your need to shore up in your life and what you need to lay at his nail pierced feet. If you're a believer this morning, this table that represents the body that was broken, the blood that was spilt, this table's for you. We do this weekly because, friends, weekly we need to be reminded that it wasn't because we were good enough or right enough or perfect enough or we were the best people out there Weekly, we need to be reminded that he, was, he suffered so that we could be loved. He was mocked so that we could be loved. Would you take a moment to meditate on that? If you're not a Christian this morning, can I just tell you Jesus loves you? Jesus loves you. If you think you're a Christian this morning, and I don't mean you're a Christian because you were born as a Christian or you were made a Christian by going to church consistently. I mean a Christian because by faith you have acknowledged Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. If you think, if you're not sure, would you leave here this morning sure that he loved you and saved you and redeemed you? Friends, we have some folks in the back that are available to pray with you this morning. Can I invite you to pray with them? If you have a need this morning, if you have something that you're going through and you want someone to pray with you, there'll be people in the back that'll be available to pray with you. But for each of us, have we come all the way to Jesus? Are we giving him our life, our all? Has your life been turned upside down by his love? Would you just spend some time with him when you're ready? Would you come? to the table and be reminded of his love for you this morning. Father, we thank you.
We thank you for the fact that we could even sing this morning that we are loved. is because of Jesus and the fact that he was mocked. The fact that we can proclaim to be free is because he suffered. The fact that we can call ourselves sons and daughters of God is because of Jesus. May we not take that for granted. May we not flippantly pass through this story in this season. May it stir up a love for you in new, fresh ways. May the cross never lose being the center of our faith. We thank you for Jesus as we come to this table. We thank you that we come because of Jesus. We love you in Jesus' name.